The UDR cast is not affiliated and does not represent any 12-step fellowship. I, Bill Ward, the host of the UDR cast, will be sharing my experience and my journey of recovery. That does include, but is not limited to, the literature contained in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps. Our guests will be sharing their own path to recovery and what has worked for them. The UDR cast encourages and supports all paths to recovery. Welcome everybody to the UDR cast. UDR stands for Uncover, Discover and Recover. My name is Bill Ward and I'm coming to you from the recovery capital of Canada, Calgary, Alberta. Here we are going to discuss everything recovery, different perspectives, different experiences, both with the people I know and with others from around the world. If you resonate with anything you've heard on this episode today, we ask that you share it with anyone who you think may benefit from it. If you have any questions or comments, please find us at billward.life and send us a message in the info section. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. If you are interested in more recovery content, you can find the buttons for the YouTube channel and other social media outlets on the homepage, and you will be redirected to those platforms. We can recover, one person, one family, one community at a time. Right after the A, B's and C's, <clears throat> or actually, uh, yeah, right after the A, B's and C's, it says, if you are not convinced on these three vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else throw it away. <laughs> if you are not convinced about like what Brandon was saying about the three vital issues, A, B and C, like, when I sponsor someone, I stop there, and I'm like, are you absolutely convinced on A? And then they usually say, yeah. B, they usually say, yeah. And if they're not sure yet, then we, we stop there, and we point out, okay, well, how many psychologists have you been to? How many of this? Have you, has your kids kept you sober? No human power. And they're like, fuck, okay, yeah, I get that. And then that God can and will. Not everyone's always convinced that God can and will. But what I've noticed is most people will say yes. And if they don't, then they're usually convinced by the end of the 12 steps anyway. So, so if you are conv- not convinced on these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else throw it away. If you are convinced, then you are now at step three, which is you make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand him. Just what do we mean by that? And just what do we do? So the decision is just a decision, right? If there's no action behind a decision, then it's nothing. Like, you know, I could make a decision to go take a piss. But if I don't get up and go take a piss, then it's nothing, (laughs) right? (laughs) Then I'll piss my pants. Exactly. That's pretty much the result of everything that we make a decision on that we don't follow through on. If we balk at it, we end up sitting in pissy pants. Okay, so it says, just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? Well, that's a pretty important two question there. Um, a lot of people don't know what, what do we mean by that and what do we do? I think the what do we do part of that is so fucking lost in the program. And we just think that we just guess what we do. We don't need to guess. That's why I got you to highlight the directions in the original manuscript. Because if you follow the directions, you will get the results of what this program has to offer. Okay. The first requirement is that you see that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. So I stop there and I go, okay, are you absolutely convinced that your life run by you is not successful? And we use all the examples that we need to. And they usually say, yeah. And word convinced is really important starting here in these two sentences, the one I just read and this one, because the word convinced means like without a doubt, right? So are you convinced without a doubt that your life run by you is not successful? That is the first requirement, right? Um, 
On that basis, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives may be good. Well, I know Bill wrote motives there, but I, just for my big book studies, I always say intentions because... I wish he didn't use motives. <laughs> it was a misprint. It was a misprint. <laughs> Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like the actor who wants to run the whole show. Is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. If arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as he wishes, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful, and trying to make these arrangements, our actor might be sometimes quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, dishonest. But as with most humans, he is more likely to have varied traits. So what is that actually saying? Well, it's saying that I'm going to try to go into life and get what it is that I think I want by being nice, kind, virtuous, modest, and self-sacrificing. So I'll use like my ex-wife for an example. I would want certain things done maybe around the house or you know certain things done so that we could leave at a certain time and do something. And I would be, because I'm really what I'm doing is I'm self-seeking, because I want something. And I want it to be done a certain time in a certain way so that I can get the results that I want. So I would go and I would ask her, okay, can we get this done? And I'm nice, I'm modest, I'm self-sacrificing. Oh, do you need a hand? Okay, I'll even go get some of the guys from work and I'll send them over and they'll help you out with whatever it is that you need. And, you know, so I'm modest and I'm self-sacrificing. But really, I'm trying to get these players to arrange everything to suit me. And if one of these players, let's say one of the guys that I sent over to help her didn't show up, now the show's not going off right. Now I get fucking a little bit pissed off and resentful. And now my, my wife didn't get what she needed done on time because she needed this help. Or maybe she was just, things took longer than she expected, right? And, and now I'm starting to become mean and egotistical because I want the outcome that I want. And I'm like, okay, well, if you don't get it done, like, I don't know what to tell you, then, then fuck the whole night. We ain't going. And now, now I'm like really grabbing at control, Right? And she's getting sad and my workers are walking on eggshells and my kids are like hiding, right? And, and I'm trying to arrange life to suit myself, right? If all the people would just do as I wish, the show would be great. Everyone would be happy, including me, right? And sometimes even when I would manipulate my wife or my kids or my friends to, to do something that I wanted it to be, and then it actually turned out good, then what am I doing? I'm looking for the big pat on the back, right? Yeah, thank me. Right? <laughs> Fuck, aren't you glad I gave you that advice? Aren't you glad I sent over those guys? Aren't you, like, my whole life was based on selfish self-centeredness. Always wanting a validation or something for me, always. And like another example is, you know, I use this example sometimes. I bring my wife home flowers. Here, babes, here's some flowers and fucking blah, blah, blah. And... Really, my motive was I want to get laid tonight and I want it to be really fucking good. But maybe she, she was tired and she didn't want to fuck me that night or something, right? And then I'd be in bed and then I'd get pissed off and then I'd be mean and egotistical and like shut her down and shut her out, right? And she's like, what? What did I do? But I had this expectation all night since the minute I went to the flower shop but I'm a saint when I bring the flowers home, right? She's like, oh, that's so sweet of you, right? And I'm like, yeah, fuck. Right? But really, the motive was like selfish and self-centered to the core. And then I'm, I'm stepping on the toes of my fellows, of her. And then she maybe gets mad at me for like being ignorant. And then I'm like, and then seemingly I heard her without provocation. What did I do? Fucking bring you flowers and you fucking get pissed off at me? Fuck, I'm never bringing you flowers home again, Right? And this is kind of like a little nutshell of what we do all the time. So I'm the actor. And I'm wearing all the masks all the time. Trying to arrange life to suit myself. Um, okay. Okay. What usually happens, the show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think that life doesn't treat him right. 
he decides to exert himself still more. He becomes on the next occasion still more demanding or more gracious, as the case may be. Still, the play does not suit him. It may be, admitting he may be somewhat at fault, he is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. What is his basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker even when he's trying to be kind? So I love that line. So with a lot of the newer people I work with, I always ask them, use that as a barometer in your life. When you're being kind to people, stop and go, why am I being kind? Why am I being so nice to certain people, right? You know, um, a lot of, there's an example that I like to use of, okay, there's a guy in the room and he likes this chick, but he, he has never met her and he doesn't know how to meet her or anything. So he knows that she has a friend that he kind of knows. So he'll go meet the friend and come off like a really nice, kind guy and, but his motive isn't to meet this woman. His motive is to meet the other woman, right? Or you know that this, this kid that you know in the program, his dad has a big company and you want a job. So you go and you befriend this kid and you're really nice to him. Why? Because you want to get to know his dad because you need a job, right? And there's lots of these like little games that we play with each other to, to kind of get what it is that we think we want. And we got to ask ourselves sometimes, why am I being kind? Down the road, we'll just, we just live that way. But I know for me, when I was first new in recovery, and I look at most of my life, like people would come up to me and talk to me at a restaurant. And I'd be like, why the fuck are you talking to me? Like, I'd literally say this. Why are you even talking to me? Mm-hmm. They're like... Well, I just thought, you know, we'd have some small chance. And I said, if I wanted to talk to you, I would have fucking talked to you. Like, I do not want to talk to people, right? And I would say to people that would look at me, I didn't even know why people were looking at me. I'd, I'd just stop and go, what the fuck? Am I wearing your shirt? Am I wearing your hat? What, what's going on? Like, I, don't, I didn't know what people were doing, right? And I always was on guard. Like, why are you looking at me? What did I do? What do you want from me? Like, like it was fucking crazy, man. I don't have a wooden aperture like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? Does anyone know what that line is? Um. That line is the most important line in the big book. To understand what self-will is. Is he not a victim? Are we, are we not all victims of a delusion? That we can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if we only manage it well. So where it says, is he not a victim? The word victim, when you look it up, Trick. means a person who's been tricked or duped. Of a delusion. A delusion is a lie that you hold to be true, even though when you look at the evidence of this lie, you can look at it and go, yeah, that's not true, but you still believe it's fucking true. So what is, what are we victims of? Well, society tells us a whole bunch of things. It tells us right from when you're a kid, you know, get a good job, get a good wife or husband, you know, Work hard, get all these things for you, get the house, get the white picket fence, get the dog, get the kids, get all these things and then you're going to be happy, right? That's, that's you being tricked. And then there's a whole bunch of other tricks that they tell us. If I have this car and I have this status and I have this, whatever this is, if you have this, whatever it is, but where do we learn that? We either learn it from our society that ingrains and indoctrinates the belief systems that we believe that we don't even have a choice in believing. Because we're sold that. Because we we're sold it. Right from the word go. And then the other parts of the delusion are built through our experience of life of getting hurt through not getting these things or trying to get them. So then we build defense mechanisms throughout that period too. So we got this whole collection 
of these things that we've been tricked by, of these delusions, of these ideologies, that if I fucking just have all this shit, that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage it well. And the word rest, you will notice, is spelled W-R-E-S-T. And when you look up that word, it means to pry, to grab, to snatch, to take, to pry out of life satisfaction and happiness out of this world by us managing it well. Well, how do I pry and grab and snatch and take? Pardon me? Manipulation. Manipulation. Mind and emotional blackmail in various types of relationships. A lot of intimate relationships degress to the point where people are using like um, not telling whole truths to try to get something from their partner or, you know, you're, you're trying to get more love from them. So you go against your own authentic truth and, and you go give them love. Because you want them to be happy even though you don't really feel like it. So you're trying to like do all these like weird things within each other's psyche to try to make each other happy. But you, you, it doesn't really work because it's all based in what? Mind. Pride. It's based in pride, it's based in ego, it's based in edging God out because it's not really based in the love, right? And, but a lot of, even our belief systems in love are skewed because our society teaches us that love is a certain thing and it's based in primarily like eroticism, um, possession, um, sex, and fucking a lot of these lower level consciousness items. So that's not even love, but your psyche believes that that's love. So then you go and try to live and just want to love, but you're not actually living with love. You're living in self-centered fear, defective character, broken pieces, insecurities, which is why it didn't work. And then what happens? Then you leave that relationship because finally it'll burn itself down. Self always burns itself down. As we become crushed by our own self-imposed crises that we could no longer postpone or evade. We, we can't postpone and evade. Eventually it falls apart. And then what happens? We go do it again. Why? Because the delusion is so strong that if I have this, this idea in my life, I'm going to be happy. So we rest our happiness and satisfaction out of this imaginary partner that presents itself in all these different faces and then, and it never works. Yeah. And, and also, then what happens? We also do it again because of, that we don't do inventories and we don't look at ourselves. So like right. in the resentment, it's like we, we, we think about who we're resentful at and then that's usually as far as anybody ever goes. So it's always everybody else's fault. Right. And then you keep going, trying to do it again, not ever looking at your part of where, where your own brokenness is contributing to the breakdown. Totally. And then down the road, we start shaming ourselves going, I'm unlovable. I, I can't, I don't, I can't, no one wants to be with me. And then we're scared to even try this again. So there's all these complex items that become part of this shit show that we're living, right? And it's the same at work, you know, trying to manage and do all this stuff at work. And then wherever you go, it's the same shit. The thing is, is that wherever you go, you go. Right? Hug. <laughs> oh, okay. and, and that's the delusion, right? The idea is there because I've learned that if I have a partner, TV told me, and I remember watching all these commercials of two people on the beach, they're fucking happy. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't I remember seeing the commercial with the family in the boat? They're all happy on the boat. They're all happy walking on that beach in that picture in my head. Like everyone's happy in these pictures in my head. So I got to try to have that picture here. But so even though I can look at all the evidence, okay, I've been in 10 failed relationships. I already have like two sets of kids with two different people. And I've had the boat. I've had the, the car. I've been to Mexico 10 times, but I'm still sitting here not happy. So, but I still believe that that's going to make me happy. So as we smash the delusion that I can drink like normal people, this delusion has to be smashed. I pursue this delusion to the gates of insanity or death. 
I will pursue the same insanity of these fucking ideologies to the gates of insanity. So I got to finally at some point go, no. Okay, this delusion is a fucking delusion. I know it. It hasn't done what it's supposed to do. Now, how do I strip it down and start over for real? Well, that's not easy, but that's what the steps will do, right? And, and our first... Branches, right? Breaking yes. yes. Okay. We start breaking the branches in the step four. First, we get to see them. Fuck, I didn't even know it. And then we can start working at it. And some of the branches are pretty hard to fucking break. So that little statement there, victim of a delusion that we can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if we only manage well. And that's all based on a foundation of what? What's our society foundation based in? Self. Self. So our society, Western society, is based on the individual. Every person for their own. And it is the foundation of selfish self-centeredness. So when we build on self, there's no, there's no good results. And when, not just for us alcoholics either. Look at normal people out there. And I have the literature here, but I'm trying to be quick. So it's in step three in the 12 and 12. It talks about normal people trying to do this too. And they're not really getting any good results either. Because everybody's living in a foundation of self. And it's pride. And pride always goeth before the fall. Pride is always seeking relief. A lot, most people at some point in their life will have a midlife crisis. A midlife crisis is them trying to fill that hole inside of themselves. But they've never been able to. And so now they're broke down. They're crushed by their own self-imposed crises. Their marriage fails because it's inevitable when you live in self too much. And then they end up splitting up, splitting the money and shit. And then the, the old guy goes and gets a young lady for a girlfriend, buys the Corvette, blah, blah, blah. Because he's trying to fix the outside stuff, but the job needs to be done on the inside. The women do the same thing, right? It's not by mistake. Most marriages are at least 50% in divorce rates. And then how many of the 50% that stay together, how many are them not really happy in the relationships they're living? Right? So when you really look at the stats of like intimate relationships, everyone has the what? The delusion that the marriage is the fucking ticket to happiness, but then half of them fail. And then the other half that are still together, probably half of them are staying in that because it's more convenient. And then they sell out their soul. They sell out their truth to stay in something they don't want to. And then they live their existence fucking half-ass happy. And what I want to highlight here is the word vitality comes in this book a number of times. Vital or vitality. Vitality means like giving of life, right? And we, we get vital. We get filled with life when we learn how to turn our will and our lives over to God. Although this decision was a vital and crucial step, vital comes from vitality. It gives you life. It could have no permanent effect unless at once followed by strenuous effort to face and be rid of the self, or the things in ourselves that have been blocking us. The things in myself that block me from love in my heart. All the things that block me are fear and resentment and greed and ideologies and all of the delusions that I live with based in a fear of me trying to get happy. But the word, the line, common sense, thus becomes uncommon sense, is you don't need, when you learn you don't need to pry or grab or snatch, you just let it all go, then everything they ever tried to go get comes to you. <laughs> right? then you're fucking happy. And you're like, how did that happen? I didn't even try. So you cease fighting anything and everyone. Mm -hmm. Who do you cease fighting? Myself. Right. Because it's up here. Right. It's always up here. It's always up there. <laughs> it looks like the fight's out here. And at first, when you're first working this program, the fight is out here. Because of so many delusions that we live in that we think it's all their fault. 
But after you work the program over time, you realize that the fight was never outside of you. It was always in my own head. Once I cease fighting myself, I cease fighting you and everything. And then I don't need to fight anything. And then life gets way different. And when you're living in love, and if you live in love every day, you're not fighting anything. Because even if you didn't get what it is that you wanted out of the person, as long as you gave them love, you know that you did everything you could from the best place possible, and that's okay. But if you tried to force it out of them and you didn't get it, now you're fighting again. And usually they're fighting back. Okay, let's keep reading. Is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things that he wants? And do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate? Snatching all they can get out of the show. Is he not even his, his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? So what I want to highlight here is, are these not the things that he wants? It's the things that we want is what we're trying to learn how to turn over. Oh, I want that woman. I want that money. I want that job. If I could only have this or this or this or this. It's usually a want that you think is going to make you happy. And usually if you can pray for it, and you would you want that? You can pray for it. You can ask for it. But don't expect it. When you least expect shit, then expect it. That's how it works. And it's kind of like as you go on your recovery journey and you have shit to let go and you're learning a lesson about whatever it is, the lesson finally is learned but maybe it's not learned fully internally, but intellectually you've learned it. Until it's let go internally, you won't get it yet. And you'll see that. It'll be something like a good relationship that you're looking for that you really want and you get it. You've seen the patterns and you're really working towards something better. But your deep subconscious hasn't let that go yet. Because it just hasn't. But then finally down the road, you'll finally have let that go. And then finally that person presents themselves to you. Because the creator will always wait till you've learned your lesson. And then he'll give you what it is that you were looking for. And I'm going to say jobs and status and all sorts of things. And then you have an opportunity. If you get the status that you wanted, then you better not abuse it. Right? If you get the relationship that you wanted, it's now a gift, right? Everything changes in how you view it now. Whereas before it was a possession and she's mine. It's like, no, she's God's. I'm just going to show up and treat her good every day. And if, she, and if I treat her good every day, the odds are she'll stay with me. I don't need to lock her in the house anymore. <laughs> right? Okay. So our actor is self-centered, egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. He is like the retired businessman who lulls in the Florida sunshine in the winter, complaining of the sad state of the nation. The preacher who sighs over the sins of the 20th century. Politicians and reformers who are sure all would be utopia if the rest of the world would only behave. The outlaw safecracker who thinks society has wronged him. And the alcoholic who has lost all and locked up. Whatever their protestations... Are not these people mostly concerned with themselves? That's important. Are most people not only concerned with their, themselves? Their own self-pity, their own resentments. All people mostly are concerned with themselves. And here's a fucking observation technique you can use. When you go to meetings and you meet other people or just in general in life. Engage in conversation. Say, hey, how are you doing? And watch them talk about themselves. Ask them another question. They'll just talk about themselves, okay? Now you start to try to talk about you. Conversation's over. Or two people that are so self-centered, they're not even having a conversation. 
They're both telling each other about themselves and no one's really giving a fuck about each other. It's so true, man. Like when I do step six stuff with sponsees, there's a few people that I know in my mind. I'll say to my sponsee, okay, I want you to go talk to this guy and watch what I said. And then they'll go and talk to that guy and go, holy fuck, I, he didn't even let me talk at all. I'm like, I know. But you noticed it, right? So there's, there's little tricks that we use as a sponsor so I can help my fucking guys understand like, get out of your own head, start caring about other people first. Right? But, so I'm not saying you sponsees, call your sponsor and totally ask them how their day is going. Because <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about either. Because there's nothing I pisses me off worse than a sponsee going, hey, how's your day going? Fuck. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what do you need? Fuck. What do, you, what do you want? You're obviously calling me for a reason. I'm not telling you how my day is. You don't need to know. Right? I'm not quite like that, but, you know... There's a, there's a process of flow to this, this stuff, right? But watch people, man. A good way to learn this program is to be a watcher of people. And I don't mean like judgmentally watch them and like go, what a selfish fucking prick. I mean, watch them take in the data and go, wow, that is so true. And then next time you're engaged in it and you see yourself doing it, you'll go, fuck, I just did that. Mm -hmm. And you brought awareness to something you weren't aware of before. And you're like, okay, that's where I bring God in. Before I go talk to somebody, let's pray. Let's ask God to guide my words. And we always bring God in, right? So observation is different than judgmentalism. Way different. And why do we take in the observation? Why do we collect the data? So we can send our sponsees to those people we want them to learn from. <laughs> sure. <laughs> How do you know you're not on my list? Uh, I probably am. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know what the fuck I was going to say. Why do we watch them so we can discern? Who we're, who we're learning from and who we want to spend time with and like how we want to be with people who are doing this thing. We have to have some discernment, otherwise we're just letting everybody in. And we right. have to have Ultimately, it's so you can be a spearhead of God's ever advancing creation. Being the intelligent agent, spearhead of God's ever advancing creation. So we're collecting the data to be aware so that we can be useful and use this information to better help serve people through sponsorship and through doing things like this. Because I've collected a lot of my data, which I'm sharing with you guys, and I'm telling you shit that I actually do because I want it to help you guys as you leave here so you guys can be spearheads for God too, right? Whether that just be in your own life, being a good person in the moment of self-sacrifice, or whether you can actually be helpful to somebody somehow using your own experiences. Because that's what this is all about. Okay, so yeah, everyone's concerned with their own stuff. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is almost the most extreme example of self-will found that could be, uh, fuck, could be found of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Okay, there's a lot in this little line here. So our troubles that we have in our life, any troubles that you have in your life are basically of your own making. And they arise out of yourself. Shanda, what does that mean? Um, that means my thoughts, my thoughts inside myself. If I'm thinking in a negative way, um, especially about myself, it just, it stems from a thought. It stems from a thought. Okay. You're on the right track. Okay. So... There's the branch. Mm -hmm. The thoughts of yourself, self-destructive thoughts or self-destructive thoughts of others is the defect of character. It's judgment. It's contempt. It's uh, self-righteous, whatever, right? So that's the branch. But our problems, we think, arise out of ourselves, deep down inside from those instincts. 
So our problems we think arise, and think about that, it arises from deep down. So on that tree that we're trying to break down, the problems that are really arising, they're arising from below the surface where you can't even see. So if I'm acting out in these self-destructive behaviors on the branches, it comes from my issues of self-worth down in the roots. That's where it's coming from. So our problems we think arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is the almost the most extreme of example of self-will run riot that could be found. So I'm an extreme example, because I am an alcoholic and addict, of self-will run riot. I'm not the only example, because our whole world is full of examples of self-will run riot. But us alcoholics, we have a mental illness. And it's based in overdoing the instincts. So we try to grab and grasp and grab and pry for more than is possible or that is even due us. So that is part of our illness is we take this to the next fucking level. Which is why when you go get advice from a normal person, they give you normal person advice and it doesn't fucking work for you. So we don't go to normal people to get our advice. We find out the hard way typically because they're just going to tell you to take a pill let it go, fucking go for a walk, whatever. You guys have learned when you talk to another alcoholic, they can calm you down, they can get you on the right track. Why? Because we get it, right? And it goes back to the old um, turbocharger ego. That is the mental illness. Normal ego, right? People working within their instincts in the circle. Normal ego works within that circle. But the alcoholic is like the truck that drives down the highway with his foot on the pedal and he just drives. And then the alcoholic is when we hit the passing gear. Wah, wah. <laughs> That's our egos, right? And when we get into those situations, we fucking go out outside of there and normal people don't understand that shit. And that is our illness. So we have a mental illness and we are the most extreme example of the self will run riot. We try to always get more than is possible pleasures that are due to me. And, and I always want more. And Michael, you said it earlier, more, more, more. And when I put in that alcoholic cycle, I'm restless, irritable, discontent, unless I can again experience a sense of ease and comfort that comes at once from a relationship. I want more. I want more. Relationship fails. I want another one. This is repeated over and over and over. Unless I can have an entire psychic change in my relationship life. Till I bring God into my relationship life, I fucking continue in the alcoholic cycle. I'm restless, irritable, discontent, unless I can again experience a sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by going and buying shit. And I will always go buy shit. Shit that I don't need. New trucks, fucking clothes, whatever. And I, what do I get? I get relief out of it only. And then this is repeated over and over. And I met a girl. She's like, I got like 15 bags of fucking new clothes that I don't even wear. Like how many people buy so many pairs of shoes and jewelry and shit. And then they have all this stuff and they don't even use it. Because we're, this is part of our illness. Restless, irritable, discontent. Unless I can again experience a sense of ease and comfort comes at once by gambling. Then I go get some relief out of gambling and then I burn my life down and I swear off and I'm not going to do it again. And then I fucking do it again because I need God there. I need God in the anger. I need God in the judgment. So we first start medicating the big glaring defects with God, but then we get into the more subtler defects because it's the subtler defects that actually make the big ones happen. So we get hold of the big ones first. Then we work our way down to the cunning and the baffling and powerful defects and work with God in those ones. <clears throat> so I'm going to quote a piece that I've quoted before out of the step four and the 12 and 12. So it goes like this. Character defects representing instincts gone astray has been the primary cause of our destructive drinking and our failure at life. Unless he is now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude him. That all the faulty foundation of his life will have to be torn out 
and built upon a new bedrock. So it's saying that the character defects, these branches that represent the instincts in the roots gone astray, is the primary cause, the number one cause of my destructive drinking first and my failure at life. But really, as I'm acting out in these defects, it's causing my failure at life that causes me to fucking drink, okay? Unless I am now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude me. If I'm not willing to work hard and put God in that fucking alcoholic cycle in those exact moments when I need it, then sobriety and peace of mind will still elude me. And first it's sobriety, but really it's the peace of mind. Because when I put God in there, I get the peace of mind because I'm not fighting myself anymore. That all the faulty foundation of his life, what's the faulty foundation of our lives? Self will have to be torn out, <laughs> ripped down and built upon a new bedrock. The bedrock is the cornerstone. So we build upon a new foundation of God. And then everything fucking changes. But the destruction of selfish self-centeredness is hard because there's a lot of pain in it because we've been using these methods of life for so fucking long because we were victims of a delusion that we could rest and change and grab our own happiness if we managed it well. A lot of it's based in our trauma, based on the ideologies. And to smash all that shit down, it's really fucking hard. But it's worth it and it's, and it's a process. And as you look at all of these manifestations of self that go in the alcoholic cycle, really all they are are fractured pieces of your wholeness. Okay? And if you're working with fractured pieces of your wholeness, um, you create more fractures. So you become more broken and life gets really fucking miserable and depression sets in. We're prey to misery and depression and we get really low. But if once we start working on these things and start bringing God into them, we start healing those little fractures and we make ourselves whole again because the wholeness of all of us is based in the love that we have. And Janine talked about the guidance system that's covered up. It's based in love. That's there to guide us, but it's been fucking fractured by our life's experiences that we've taken in only through the five senses. And when we take in life through the five senses, we build all these ideologies, but there's a sense that we haven't ever used. And it's the sixth sense. That's this one. That's the one that's there to guide our life. So, Again, the fundamental idea of God is, is within every one of us, every God, woman, and child, but it's often obscured, blocked off, not gone, by calamity, pomp, and worship of other things. While it's the pomp and the worship, what's the pomps? It's self, self-centered fear, self-centered egocentricism, self-centered me trying to look good for all the women out there because I fucking want one, right? All this pomp and worship. What's the worship? Well, I worship the ideologies of marriage, of status, of job, of money, of what other people think of me. These are the things that create the calamity. So, um, covered by calamity and pomp and worship of other things. I need to clear out the calamity, the pomp and the worship of the other things to get to that fundamental idea of God. And then I start listening to that and moving forward with that, and then everything starts to change. And that's a process. So as I remove all that shit, I become more whole. That's why it's a journey of healing. And that's why in every circumstance you get in, your old pattern is ego, fear, control, manipulation, because I need to be happy and I'm gonna do this because I need to get happiness, but then you go, whoa, fuck, here's that situation. What is this but a miracle of healing? Circumstances made him willing to believe. Okay, I'm agitated. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to be lustful. And then we bring God in right there. And then that is the miracle of healing. If I'm willing to bring God in. Because sometimes the fucking power of the old process is more powerful. 
And what happens when that happens is you go down the fucking rabbit hole and you will watch yourself go down this fucking hole into selfish and self-centeredness and go, I'm going and I can't even stop it. And then we go down the rabbit hole of self and then we're stuck there. And there's a lot of pain there. Yeah. Anyone relate to that? Yeah. Anyone want to share a story on that? Mm -hmm. So you're spinning down the rabbit hole of self, mm -hmm. but you don't even know any different. And you're just going there. Yeah. But you stayed sober. Oh, yeah. And that's like, that is part of the inner turmoil before serenity. You have to go through some of that shit, bro, for some of the shit to make sense, yeah. right? And to understand, like, it's really important. I say it all the time in the study. You have to understand you have a mental illness and that this shit's going to happen and to know that, okay, it's going to end. But the thing with the alcoholic mind is it's always been this way and it's always going to be this way and it's not going to fucking end. It does end. And, but you got to learn that through staying sober because you haven't built any patterns of sober patterns of being able to see the true sober patterns, Right. And so also later, when you get like more time in, you're going you're gonna to know, okay, this is self and I am now spinning out in self and I know it, which is fucking even worse, <laughs> right? <laughs> to know like, okay, I can grab onto God here, but I'm not going to because I just want to go into self, even though I know I'm going to suffer greatly for it. And you just go down anyway. And then... That's terrible too. So it's all terrible, but as long as you can stay close to your peers, mm. do your inventories, and just keep going to meetings through those periods of time, fuck, you'll learn. Right? It's, it, it's a process. It's like sometime like before, and I, I feel like um, learn, learning about it before it happened um, was really a game changer because when I went down the last one, and I was watching myself go down it, right? And I was like, okay, I heard that this is going to happen. You know, this is when, like, you know, the around the eight-month mark or whatever, like, later after the treatment center and the, you ride it out and then life starts happening and you start coming up against self. I was prepared for it because I had been listening to just stuff and talking to people and I knew that it was, it was a thing that was going to happen. The emotional turmoil before the surrender was going to be a thing. And, and if it wasn't, I was doing something wrong. And that the reconstruction process is, is a painful process as I'm surrendering self. So knowing that was really helpful in, in watching myself go through it. I knew what it was. And I knew like that it was normal. And that the things I needed to do to... So that day I took my kids to the park to get out of it. And just... I, I stayed in it far too long. Like I could have gotten... I could have chose to get out of it a, a lot later. Um, but I kept thinking this is part, this is a part of the course and this is like to be expected and I was thinking about how I, I didn't know that like my first time in AA because people don't like people who are working a program and giving the message sometimes that point is missed where it's like okay this is going to happen and these are the things that are going to happen and this is what to do where I knew this time and um, I don't know like to, to have it not that I was prepared, but to expect it. And then it doesn't feel so hopeless. Right. That's the key. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. To know that this stuff is going to happen mm -hmm. when you're in it. Maybe you get that moment of clarity where you're like, fuck, I heard that this was going to be like this. Mm -hmm. It gives you that little glimmer of hope that like, okay, fuck, this is normal. Because in the alcoholic mind, it's just, it's always been like this. It's not going to change and I'm fucking, I'm in hell. Thank you for tuning in to the UDR cast. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. The viewpoints and the opinions expressed today were solely of the individual sharing them. If you resonated with this episode, please follow us and share this link with anyone that may benefit from it. Please visit us at billward.life to see everything that we have going on. We can recover. One person one family, one community at a time.